Welcome, everybody, to the Fireside Charla series. I brought to you in partnership with United Latinx Fund and Latino Coalition of Los Angeles. I'm Richard Corral, Interim Executive Director of the United Latinx Fund. This online event series aims to engage, educate, and advocate on important and timely topics that impact LA's Latinx community during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'd like to quickly thank tonight's sponsors, Southern California Gas Company and J.P. Morgan Chase for the commitment to and investment in nonprofits like the United Latinx Fund that work to transform, uplift, and improve our community's quality of life. Our program is designed to engage you, our audience. So if you have a question, please enter your questions in the chat box and note that everyone's audio and video will be muted into the, until the question and answer session of our program. Um, tonight's program is not only uh, being recorded, but also it's streaming on uh, Facebook Live. So if you'd like to access the video, and I'll encourage all of you to do that, please visit the Latino Coalition of Los Angeles' Facebook page. Uh, we do have a chat box moderator. Uh, her name is Cindy, and Cindy will be uh, sharing the link to the Latino Coalition's uh, Facebook page so that you can pull up the Facebook Live, and as well as she's going to be moderating the chat box. So if you do have questions, there is somebody who's um, moderating that and who will summarize your questions. So please do take it seriously. We do have somebody who's um, solely dedicated um, to, that, to that task. Um, tonight's conversation centers on uh, health, wellness, and mental health uh, as it relates to COVID-19 and the Latinx community. And we have two very distinguished um, scholars, researchers, administrators, practitioners. Uh, they do so much and they're anchored in uh, two very notable uh, local institutions which have been actively working uh, to address systemic inequalities in healthcare, particularly when it comes to communities of color. And with that, uh, I'd like to introduce our guest. Uh, our first guest is Dean Laura Mosqueda, who is the Dean of the Keck School of Medicine of USC, also a professor of family medicine and geriatrics, and a professor at the USC Leonard Davis School of Gerontology. In her role, she is leading an agenda focused on groundbreaking research, biomedical education, and social justice. Prior to her appointment as Dean, she served as Associate Dean of Primary Care and Chair of Family Medicine. Dr. Mosqueda's major area of research for which she's known internationally is understanding the causes and consequences of elder abuse. We also have joining us, Dr. Ilian Shapiro, Director of Health and Wellness Education at Ultimate Medical Services, Medical Healthcare Services, that provides free or low cost health services, urgent care, dental, and of course, mental health services to more than 300,000 uh, Angelinos. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shapiro, uh, for pleasure. joining us uh, today. So let's go ahead and, and let's get started. We have so much to cover um, and a relatively short amount of time to do it. So we all know that May is Mental Health Awareness Month. So please share how COVID-19 has fundamentally changed your respective healthcare institutions approach to addressing mental health, particularly among vulnerable communities of color. And I just want to remind everybody again, if you have questions, please do put them in the chat box, um, especially as our speakers do answer some of these important questions. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start with Dr. Shapiro. Um, in Altamed, we, we have been part of the community for the past uh, 50 years. Uh, we have seen almost everything. And right now, the, the thing that we're seeing, is, and a lot of people are asking why are Hispanos or uh, communities of color more more uh, 
having more problems and more affected? Is this virus actually affecting them in the health part of it, in the mental health part of it? On reality, I tell them that this is not a genetically modified virus. It's actually decades of problems with social determinants of health. They are just reflecting right now that the system is completely stressed and we are having issues with medical stuff, food, complete insecurity of everything from lack of work, under under insurance uh, or no insurance at all and plus the politics that you're, they're hearing then if you stress already a community that ha was having chronic problems and chronic stress right now they are just switching to you know to a stressful situation called toxic stress one of the advantages that that we're seeing and we're loving is actually we tried for many years to create a, a mental telehealth service to make sure that we are reaching out to the patients. Why? Because we know that one day without uh, work, one day without actually missing that, that, that important part of not eating if they don't work or not, and, and, and all the problems that they were having, trying to get to us from, ga from gas, from the car, from transportation, all this stuff, if we can just reach them at the time that they needed us by phone, or by video, that can actually facilitate absolutely everything. And right now, we're seeing that the community is loving that 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 it's not the same, but they are loving that option of, of continuing services and actually being represented with this telehealth opportunities that we're having. Excellent. That sounds like um, not only a, a valuable way of providing service, but a way that sort of has been pushed forward or accelerated uh, in light of, of COVID-19. So, so building on uh, something that's pre-existing, but taking it to a new level and making it more right. ubiquitous, more accessible, um, and, and also more relevant and timely uh, in light of uh, the current circumstance. Uh, that's fascinating. Uh, Dean Mosqueda, uh, please, could you also share a little bit about um, how your healthcare system uh, that you oversee has responded uh, not only to COVID, but also uh, specifically uh, the mental health crisis that is emerging. Yeah, well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's really great to come in to a community that doesn't call me Dr. Mosquito. So that I appreciate uh, too. <laughs> um, I wanted to say that right when you were taking a sip of, of wine there too. Um, it, uh, and I'll also mention that my friend and colleague, Dr. Lourdes Baiscan de Garbanati is on the phone. Um, she's a professor here at the Keck uh, School of Medicine of USC, and she's welcome to, to chime in uh, as well. I'll tell you, when I was thinking, I couldn't agree more with what my friend and colleague Ilan uh, just, just talked about in terms of our use of telemedicine as well. It's amazing to me how this kind of crazy crisis has just dissolved some of the problems that we thought were insurmountable and all of a sudden, hey, we can do it. Uh, and we can do it because it's really important to serve, to serve our community and our patients. Thinking about the, the mental health aspect of things, I, I would say there's three, three particular um, aspects that, that I'm really noticing right now. One is people are sad. I can't see my family. I can't see my grandkids. Um, I can't attend a funeral. Um, you know, these things that are really heartbreaking. I'm seeing people also that are feeling nervous. Um, what's gonna happen? What if I lose my job? Um, what if I can't get what I need at the market? And then the third thing I'm seeing um, that I guess is kind of a mental health slash social issue is just anger. Like what, <laughs> pardon me for saying it, but what the hell, right? You know, what's, what's going on? I'm, I'm working in a low paying job. I'm working in a nursing home uh, or at a supermarket and I can't get adequate masks or, or protective equipment and um, just trying to, and just getting angry about our lack of adequate response and, and support. So those are some of the things I'm, that, that I've been, been seeing and, and hearing from our community. Excellent. And so when it comes to those um, very clear needs uh, and trends that you're identifying, is there, are there any particular new ways in which your healthcare system is is sort of pivoting or responding or modifying or adjusting in order to um, address those very specific trends that you're noticing around mental health? 
Yeah, well, this is where I think we have the great opportunity to, to look at the personal level and then more at the societal and policy level. So at the personal level, of course, we want to help people, individuals, um, through telemedicine, through provision of, of adequate mental health services. But I think it also is an opportunity for us to talk more at a policy level of if so many people are experiencing this, you know, how do we get out the vote and how do we make change um, so that we as a society are better supporting and addressing these issues as well? I like it. I like the sort of uh, melding of both very practical uh, programmatic changes in terms of telemedicine, but then also coupled with a very, uh, with an eye, with an eye towards policy, which is fantastic because that's actually what we're going to be uh, talking about in, in a little bit. So moving on, uh, you know, we want to be able to, uh, as much as possible, address and ameliorate the disproportionate health and mental health impact on communities of color. I, I swear to you, I think every single day this past week, I think I've seen an article from some publication addressing this issue, um, disparities of, of different kinds. So uh, as you were sort of queuing up, uh, Dean Mosqueda, um, what policy recommendations would you propose to prepare for what I'm calling COVID 2.0, which is just you know the next iteration of COVID that's clearly been predicted and is uh, coming down the line. Um, at least we have the foresight to know, right, that it's a, an iteration is coming, another iteration is coming. So with that in mind, from the policy perspective, what are your recommendations? And again, we have folks here on the line that actually, you know, are joining that could do something about um, some of your ideas. So please take it away. Well, the first thing I'll mention is I think we need an informed public and informed policymakers. So um, this, this now I'll put on my nerd hat and say, we need good research to inform policy. Um, and you know, anecdote, it, the, the plural of anecdote is not data, right? So um, we need to collect the anecdotes, but then we really need to study it in a systematic way so that we're making sure that we're not just you know, um, good-minded about things and wanting to do good, but then kind of it inadvertently not really getting to the root root of the issue. So I think good research is really important. And I think having people who are well educated with accurate information is really important uh, for good policy. And then I think the good policy are things like making sure people get affordable health care and making sure that mental health is a part of the health care. You don't you can't separate this from the rest of you. And uh, you know all of us uh, I think particularly in, in family medicine know that it's, it's, it's a holistic approach we have to take. And we know absolutely that people who suffer from anxiety and depression and other sort of, of mental health disorders have physiologic consequences that go along with it. And if you only pay attention to somebody's blood pressure without understanding their underlying fear or anxiety, depression, and you're not getting to the root of it, you can throw medicines all you want at the blood pressure, but you're really not taking care of the whole person. Right. right. Dr. Shapiro, your thoughts? Uh, the Mosqueda, you, you hit one of the things that I learned this week. Um, we started with a community health specialist program um, the past. I, actually, it was going to be the new program, and suddenly COVID changed absolutely everything that we knew. Then um, we have a running joke that the new, the new thing, the new stable thing is actually just change. Uh, and that's the way that we live right now. And, that, and we're enjoying that part. And I'm saying this because the social determinants of health and the mental health part of it have been relegated for many years. And right now we are actually understanding the impact that that has for, for, our, for our life. Then one of the things that for sure we need to start talking about is the pipeline development. It, it's impossible to, to create like this islands of different populations that don't have um, uh, doctors that don't speak the same language or, phys or, or uh, specialists or nurses or community health workers that don't speak the same language. That actually, it's a gap. In, by language, I mean culture. By language, I mean maybe they speak the same language or just being interested on that population and we're lacking that. Then that actually creates a bridge on, you know, 
if they need to take the tecito, the, el tecito de, de manzanilla, or if you put like, you know, make sure that the mollejera, it's good, porque se cayó. Then like a lot of things that you need to understand from the community that applies to mental health and the way that they understand and absorb information. One of the things that we, we and, and right now, for example, the community health workers um, the, the, and the community health specialists are doing an amazing job. Why? Because, and, and, and any doctor can actually tell you this. Me, as a doctor, I'm there like 20 minutes, maybe half an hour, but the, the, these, these community health workers, I call them community health warriors. They are with a patient at the time that they need it and they understand what's happening with grandma, grandpa, you know, if, if someone on the family was deported and they understand what the background of this. And that's actually when they start healing. When we actually go with them and go with the supermarket, like this is the things that you need. Let me help you with that thing. Right now we're helping deliver food. We're helping the mm. basic thing, the people that are like, in their house with anxiety, uh, everything's turning out, but they are, they're sick, they have COVID-19 and they cannot leave home. We're actually delivering their food with the community health specialist. And an integrated way to approach, not with, with actually a patient at the center and not our thoughts, it's something that I, that I think that, that will change uh, in the future. So it's, it's interesting because when I'm, I'm hearing you both uh, speak uh, as medical professionals, um, and what I'm hearing increasingly in terms of the recommendations, in terms of uh, what works, in terms of addressing the current moment, are a lot of um, solutions and ideas that aren't necessarily 100% driven by medical professionals, um, that are in concert and supportive of, of the work of medical professionals, but that are fundamentally uh, distinct right, from the work of medical professionals. So that, I think that's, um, I, I, and for me, it provides a little bit, it provides a lot of bit of hope. Uh, and the reason why it provides hope is because as a philanthropy, we invest in nonprofit organizations, right? We invest in nonprofits that are working to advance jobs and housing. And when it comes to social determinants of health, uh, like Dr. Shapiro was mentioning, if you have a job, and if you have a roof over your head, the likelihood that your ability to uh, have more uh, supportive, more preventative, more effective health care increases, right? And so uh, that kind of cues up uh, my next uh, comment and my next question is, as a philanthropy, we're always interested. How can grass tops and grassroots nonprofit leaders support and advance your proposed recommendations and solutions? How can nonprofits, what can we do in our sector to support some of the ideas and recommendations that you've just shared? Um, go ahead, uh, Dean Mosqueda. Well, I think there's lots of ways that are both big, big and little. Uh, you know, there are some, some philanthropy that have huge amounts of money that can help with planning grants and, 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 uh, and helping us figure out what some of the solutions are. Um, and I think that, that one of the great things uh, philanthropic organizations can do is push folks like me and academics to say, make sure that you're hearing the voice of the community. And there's a collaboration with, you know, that it's really done from the very beginning with the, with the community. And, um, and so I think that, that folks in, in philanthropic organizations have a, an opportunity to really hear other voices and push the people you're funding and the organizations you're funding to make sure that we're paying attention to all of those things as well. It also is really striking to me um, how you can help bring, uh, bring new collaborations together. I think that's a wonderful experience I've had with philanthropic organizations that have been that role of connectors uh, mm -hmm. and don't forget to do X, Y, or Z. So those are a few things that come to mind. In addition to the, of course, the actual things that we would like to get funded. We have a street medicine program going on and it's been incredible what we've learned in terms of caring for people who are living under bridges and on the sidewalks and, and trying to figure out issues related to COVID-19, doing wound care from a distance, 
Um, and we've, we would never have been able to get some of these programs off the ground um, without, without having uh, the philanthropic organizations behind us uh, to help. So um, I really appreciate what you're doing um, very, very much. I think it's critically important to, to cause if, if it, if you don't speak up for some of these folks, that's the other thing is I think a lot of the people were, that we serve feel very disempowered and afraid um, of government. And, 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 um, and so um, helping give people a voice, I think is really key. Great. Um, one thing that I do want to, uh, before I sort of pass uh, the mic on to Dr. Shapiro, I do want a f to just give a friendly reminder to everybody, please do put your uh, questions in the chat box because we're going to be approaching uh, the chat box uh, and revisiting the chat box for questions uh, during the Q&A. So please do uh, visit the chat box and do uh, put your questions there because we're approaching that segment of to, to tonight's program. Dr. Shapiro, uh, please, the, the floor is yours. Uh, well, uh, one of the things that we need to do is try to figure out what actually worked right now with uh, COVID-19. Um, we needed to implement stuff. We needed to innovate. And this is the moment that we need to understand what things we did as a group that made a difference right now. Because we, we jumped on the promise of telehealth. We jump, we're jumping right now. We have Apple and Google talking together. And we have a lot of things happening right now with, that we need to replicate. And we need to stop having, you know, uh, what, what, and probably um, uh, the Mosqueda probably has, has uh, the same feeling that we, we get a lot of meeting-itis and then not a lot of doing-itis. Then that, that's what we need to start pushing forward um, with a lot of the things that we have right now. We moved in a couple of weeks, we moved from a, a 300,000 patient uh, system that was face-to-face -face, uh, based to actually doing more than 60% of everything that we're doing by telehealth. Then we're moving forward to the next generation of information and it didn't cost that much. And we were thinking about barriers that didn't exist. We, we had all these things about, you know, the communities of color not having access to whatever, but most of them in us actually have it. Then there's a lot of exciting things that we need to approach right now. And uh, the philanthropic area can actually push forward this conversation. And, and, and make sure that it continues. My, my, I'm, I'm deadly afraid that they will pull the plug on, on telehealth when this actually starts mailing, you know, being slow, it will go away. COVID will slowly go away. Then I, I'm deadly afraid that it will pull out all the efforts that we have done in technology and efforts for the community for mental health, um, um, medications, everything that we're doing and, and pull it out. And that's something that I think that we need to create that partnership um, to make sure that the good things stay and the bad things are like destroyed. So, uh, Dr. Shapiro, thank you so much uh, for that because uh, you really teed up an important question and I'm, I'm gonna do something that I don't normally do, but we only have about eight minutes left with Dr. Shapiro. And Cindy, I know has been doing a great job with the chat box, but we do have somebody from uh, uh, LA County on the line, we have Luisa Oyage, and she is um, an executive uh, on the executive team of uh, Supervisor Janice Hahn. And uh, she had a question uh, about what can the county do to provide more services? And I'm very familiar uh, with the work that Altamed has been doing, um, not only in terms of testing, but also in terms of engaging cities and also trying to partner with with the county. So before you go, because I just, I have to use the time wisely. Um, Dr. Shapiro, could you please uh, give some very explicit, um, clear, because you want to talk about doing, no meeting night is here. We're not going to have any meeting itis under my watch. We're going to have doing itis. And so if you could tell us specifically, how can the county better partner with Altamed in order to address not only COVID 1.0, but COVID 2.0? And uh, Cindy or Jake, after Dr. Shapiro responds, I'd like to unmute uh, Luisa so she can have some, a few words with uh, Dr. Shapiro. So Dr. Shapiro, take it away. We need to make sure that we have technology-based systems between each of us. We need to make sure that we, right now, the people that we're having the second wave, as I call it, the second wave of unemployed people that we will be 
handling in the community. They know that they can reach us because that's why we are here. Um, there's no excuse uh, in LA County to have people that do not have care. We're here for them. Then make sure that you know push them into our into our, to us, making sure that we're sharing information. Um, Dean Mosca actually said one of the most important things and challenges that we have in LA in LA County that is actually homelessness and making sure that street medicine is one of the priorities that we can reach out with the uh, with the county and and creating partnerships because you know it doesn't matter which system you are here in LA County we're all working for the same goal that making making everything better then if we all can make that that's very important Excellent. And so, um, Cindy or Jake, if you could please unmute uh, Luisa Oyage. She asked the last question, so you see her user ID. Uh, Luisa, are you uh, unmuted? Yes. You are. Luisa, thank you so much for joining us. You have a direct line here to, to Dr. Shapiro. I know that there have been some amazing successes uh, at the county and Dr. Barbara Ferrer, but I also know that there are some challenges, uh, like with any uh, large-scale public health intervention, particularly when it comes to once individuals have been positively identified and they don't have health insurance, oftentimes, you know, they have to go to providers like Optimate. So I'm wondering if we might be able to right here on this call right now, uh, maybe make this connection and maybe address this important issue. Luisa, your thoughts. Um, my thoughts on that question, uh, you did put me on the spot. I was more I did. trying to get, Absolutely. Uh, trying to get <laughs> You know me. You know me, Louisa. You no, know me. <laughs> I'm trying to identify what the county needs to do. One of the things that I've been an employee for the county and been on the eighth floor for the last 20 years of my life. Um, and so one of the things I've seen is the problems that we had 20 years ago are still so relevant today. And it hurts me a lot to see this. Um, one of the things that I see so much is the culture and competence that happens in, in many of our day-to-day -day work. And I think that's one that we need to figure out how we can address that issue. Uh, for instance, I think Dr. Chavito, you just nailed it on the head. You know, I that I put on every night on my PS, on my everywhere, because I know that's gonna prevent me from catching the virus. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, we can laugh about it, but there's a lot of this holistic belief that happens in our communities. And I wanna hear from, from both of you, um, also uh, Dean um, Mosquera, about what we can do as a county. I mean, we've always talked about promotoras. 20 years ago, we've been talking about promotoras. Now we're still talking about promotoras. It's like, wow, and the, the dialogue hasn't changed. So I think that's what I, I'm looking for, how we can merge our interests together and our energies together on this one. Great. So I know Dr. Shapiro has to leave in four minutes, uh, but Dean Mosqueda, I know you had a, a question directed uh, to you. Uh, I wanna go ahead and allow you to answer that question and then we'll have uh, for some final, final parting remarks from uh, Dr. Shapiro. Yeah, well, one, one comment to make is uh, we are really taking this issue uh, of, of cultural, cultural humility very seriously and we're instituting a curriculum at our medical school where every student will get trained in cultural confidence and cultural humility, um, understanding that we can't always have somebody from your community who ends up being a physician serving, but at least um, at least we can do a better job with with what we have with what we have right now. Um, and I do think we have to move from no, like we know that promotors work. We have the data. People, doctor like Dr. Baiskande have collected some of that data. But now this is where it has to shift into policy to get it funded and to actually get it going in a big way. Um, and, and we just, uh, this is again to me where it really gets to, to uh, getting out the vote um, and um, getting people elected who will enact the policies that, that, that we know are needed. Um, I think there's huge opportunity with, with the county um, um, and, um, and have so appreciated um, some of the partnerships that, that we've had with them. We worry about the businesses um, in the Latino community um, who've suffered horribly throughout all of this. And you just wonder again, what government can be doing to, to help keep, 
keep these businesses going and pay attention to the business community. What we can be doing as healthcare providers, um, dealing, talk about, talking about stress and anxiety. Wow. I mean, it's, it's been just gigantic for the, for the local business community. So that's another area that, that also needs to be thought about and addressed. Um, I, I want to be careful because I know Dr. Shapiro has to go. Uh, so yes. let, let me let you get the last word in before you have to take off, Elan. Take it away. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm actually uh, with the American College of Healthcare Executives with the Latino part. We, we're going to be having a conversation uh, and I really wanted to be here with, with, with you all. And uh, my, my last words are like, this is the moment to change the way that we think. We need to understand that we never were in control. Control is something that we just don't have. We need to understand right now that resiliency and the way that we are adapting to this moment will change the way that we think and feel. And we can choose to make it something positive and grow or negative and get the marks and scars from this. I'm choosing right now with the partners that we have here in the table to make sure that we have something amazing going on for us, making sure that all the fears that we were having at the beginning, the feeling that we were at home, and suddenly, you know, we started actually loving being at home and talking with the family. And yes, it's stressful, and, and sometimes we, we need some, some other things. But most importantly, to be positive. Um, there's a lot of learning to understand. This virus has a lot of teachings, and not medical teachings, but social teachings, the ter social determinants of teachings a lot of economics involved with it. There, there's a lot of things that we need to change as a society. And this is the moment that we can restart. Then um, thank you for the opportunity. I'm here. I, I already put on the, on the, on the website and chat, uh, you know, where you can reach me at. Feel free to send me messages. I'm here for you. And dime uh, queda, por favor, un placer. Cristina, always, Cristina Sánchez, un placer. Y mi compadre, muchas gracias. A usted. Okay. Bye. So I want to I want to pivot back to uh, Cindy. Now that we have Adin Mosqueda for an entire thirty minutes, and she's going to be joining our our mixer as well. Um, Cindy, apologies um, I, that I kind of uh, intervened there, but I, I did see um, a, a question that was very much related to Altamed's work in the county. And so I wanted to make sure to get that before uh, Dr. Shapiro had to leave. So, Cindy, my apologies. Please take it away, and you can uh, go ahead and moderate the, the Q&A. No worries. Thank you, Richard. I'm glad that you caught on to that and you were able to connect those two. Um, so I do have a question on the chat box that I think it's very much related to, you know, the topic of having that in X communities, having accessibility, um, and being able to identify um, having health, um, mental health issues. So the question is for you, Laura, um, it's from Daisy. And what she's saying is, if there is a hotline um, or any sort of like way that, she, that um, the Latino community can reach out directly to you guys to kind of like, again, overcome this like stigma associated with, you know, health issues being in the Latino community and being able to talk to them directly. But I think most importantly, having it accessible in Spanish. Um, so, would you like to take on that? Uh, I wouldn't like to take it on, but I will. Uh, and, and so, I'm not aware of a hotline, but I think one of the really important things this person has highlighted is the stigma attached with it. It's so weird to me. Like, we don't get accusatory if somebody has diabetes. They don't have to be embarrassed if you, you know, if you have high blood pressure. But somehow we put that on uh, with mental health, and so I think it's important to explain it to people in a way that really gets almost to the physiology of it, you know, uh, and that it's not your fault. And, and it's not just something that you can pull yourself out of. Um, and, and I think this is something that the promotoras understand really well and are very skilled at. I know we did a, what we call a community corner, Dean's community corner. We had over a hundred promotoras and we were able to talk about what COVID is and also um, address some mental health issues as well. Uh, talking about it and acknowledging it, I think is really important. And I find that particularly with older adults, it's more like, oh, I'm not crazy. Uh, and when you try to bring up feeling sad, et cetera. And so taking it out of that realm of, doesn't mean you're crazy. It's just, 
are you feeling a little bit down? And so I think thinking about the language we use, not labeling it uh, the way we tend to do in medicine, but just having a, a warm uh, interpersonal conversation of a safe place to be, a safe place to talk, um, and, um, and not trying to, to label it with some medical term that, that ends up making people worried um, that, you know, that, that, they, that, that they're getting labeled as crazy. It's something I hear all the time, and I think it's really important to, that, that's why instead of using words like depression, you can ask if people are feeling down or low, things like that. Yeah, thank you so much for answering that. Um, I did want to give Daisy an opportunity to answer back um, if there's any comments you want to make. But I do want to point out to you folks that I will be providing on the chat box a Spanish language resource link. So then that way people, if you want to share this information, it's all in Spanish. So again, really addressing that um, language barrier and giving this um, the Latino community an opportunity for them to reach out and read all of this in their language. So Daisy, anything you would like to add? Yeah, thank you, Cynthia. No, yeah, I totally agree with the difference in language. Um, personally, sometimes, uh, at least when talking to uh, patients, um, they just wanna talk. So that's why I was wondering if there was like a hotline where they are able to just like talk and then that way initiate hopefully um, like the process to helping them get mental health services because often they feel that whole association of like well mental health you know so I just was wondering hopefully in the near future to have that hotline at least for patients to be able to get over the stigma um, so yeah thank you yeah and I think you know a hotline will be important but only if people call it um, yeah. and, and are comfortable calling it. I know we have one program we've started with, uh, with our medical students where we have them uh, doing FaceTime with um, older adults who are sort of having to socially um, isolate at home. And, um, and so they're able to talk and see each other. And it's been a really wonderful, heartwarming uh, program. And we've identified sometimes people who are feeling pretty seriously down and then able to help them get um, get healthcare services related to that because you can do counseling over the phone and via telehealth as well. Definitely, thank you. Awesome, thank you so much for answering that. Um, and thank you, Daisy, for your question. I do have another question for you, Laura, if you can um, kind of pick up on this, but they're asking about specifically messaging the youth and young adults. How do we really get this message out to this community? Um, and again, also addressing that this this is an issue that's happening, um, and really how can we best engage them into seeking out for help? Yeah, I'm really worried about what's happening to kids through all this. Um, there was just a, recently an article in a prestigious journal called JAMA Pediatrics talking about the dangers of uh, kids not getting into classrooms, not just because of the academics, but because they're seeing higher rates of anxiety disorders, which can show up in a whole variety of ways with kids. And now that here they are at home with parents who are stressed. Um, you mentioned earlier that I do uh, research in causes and consequences of elder abuse, and I'm sort of interested in family violence in general. So we're, we're really worried about the stress this puts on family situations and how this also can end up in abusive situations. So, um, um, the pediatricians are really doing major reach outs as our community organizations to kids to see what can we do to help them stay um, physically active, um, uh, socially active with each other um, so that they're still getting kind of their basic needs met um, emotionally as, as well as, as along uh, with, with the academics. I'm afraid I didn't answer your question. Um, um, so it was, it was more about how do we talk to the kids. So I think depending on the age of the kids, um, I, was it more about young adults, Cindy? Can you remind me? They asked for both, um, about youth and young adults. Yeah. So, so depending on the age group, it has to be age appropriate. Um, so you have to see where they are developmentally in terms of what, what it is they can understand. Um, Sometimes, you know, for little ones, it's a matter of reading books and then talking to them about it afterwards. And then just hearing them talk about it and or even look at pictures and talk about it can help them kind of express what it is they might 
they might be feeling. And I think artwork is a great way for doing that. When it comes to teenagers and, and young adults, again, I think normalizing it instead of coming at it um, and just opening it up in the most, um, in the most understanding um, um, way that's non-threatening and non-accusatory and even opening yourself up, you know, gosh, I've been feeling so nervous about everything going on here. And so is dad, how, how are you doing with this? And uh, like allowing yourself to be vulnerable, I think especially with teenagers and young adults um, so that they feel comfortable expressing themselves is another way to go. Awesome, thank you so much. And I will be dropping um, the website and Facebook link um, for USC, so you guys will see that on the chat box. Thank you.